Hello again. Today's guest is an author the British government would dearly like to forget. He's the maverick ex-skipper of the Royal Naval Ice Patrol ship HMS Endurance, who gained notoriety during the Falklands conflict for his outspoken views on British policy. Today, after years of putting the frights not only up the Argentines, but also the British Admiralty, Captain Nick Barker has retired to the beautiful hill country of Northumbria. He's already completed two thrillers and is currently working on his third, as Sheila Matheson discovered when she paid him a visit at his home near Rothbury. Captain Nick Barker, retired naval officer who came to fiction writing through his experiences in the Falklands War. As captain of HMS Endurance in the South Atlantic, he sent the first warnings of the impending invasion. He was ignored. When the Argentines moved on to South Georgia and their fleet approached the Falklands, Endurance was the first British vessel to engage in action. No one knew the region better than Captain Barker and his crew. They played a key part in Britain's victory. And when the fighting was over, it was Captain Barker who accepted the Argentine surrender of South Georgia. But he's convinced if the government had heeded his warnings, the Falklands War could have been averted. Now he's retired from service and lives far inland, in a house overlooking the Coquit Valley in Northumberland. His home is filled with keepsakes from his own days at sea and those of his father. Nick Barker was born into a naval family. His father was a lieutenant commander who died in action when Nick was just six. His mother was an artist. But there was never any doubt that her son was destined for a life at sea. No one could have predicted his late career as a novelist. Ironically, it was the Falklands War that gave birth to his newfound talent. He'd been gagged by the men from the ministry about the facts behind the war, so it was to fiction that he turned. Outrage about his treatment galvanised him into writing his first novel, Red Ice, which is set in the South Atlantic. He wrote the first draft while on duty on the bridge of HMS Endurance during battle. His agent teamed him up with a professional writer, Anthony Masters, and the partnership has been successful. A second novel followed, and they're working on the third now. He's found the transition from professional sailor to novelist straightforward. So far, most of his material has come from his first career. But his success must make those men in grey suits rue the day they disbelieved the word of an officer and a gentleman. Nick Barker, not only an officer and gentleman, but something of a novelty on this programme because you are the first writer we've met who is a co-author. You write your thrillers in conjunction with somebody else. Now, I would have imagined that because fiction is such a personal thing, that, be, that would be very difficult. It was very difficult, Bob, but the novel originally was conceived on board Endurance and I didn't require much imagination, I just looked out to the window. But when I took it to Collins, I think it was, the first publisher to reject it, and several did after that, they said there wasn't any sex in it. And um, they also said that it was episodic, and I said, well, First of all, there isn't much sex in the Antarctic. Um, <laughs> and secondly, that uh, if, the, if there was any in the Falklands, um, they'd know, everybody would know about it the following morning. So it was Anthony Master's job to put the sex in there? Well, it, well he certainly helped. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you work together? I mean, do you leapfrog? Does he write a chapter and then you write a chapter? What has happened is that I've written the synopsis at the basis of the book. I then do the gung-ho bits and he does the, what might be called the, the dialogue and, uh, together with the domestic side, uh, and we shunt brown paper envelopes between us and the postman gets very bored with this. Uh, but I think for this coming one, we will, we've modernized ourselves and we now have a fax. Do you fight about the storyline? Not a lot, no. We, we've, uh, we've so far had a very amicable 
uh, relationship at 300 miles apart. But we do meet uh, in, the, in the heat of battle, as it were, uh, about every two or three weeks to, to sort out any differences that we might have. Well, Nick, your, your first novel, <laughs> Red Ice, and also your second one, Rig, which was about the blowing up of a North Sea oil well, appear to have been prophetic warnings. Was that deliberate? Well, the first one was rarely written because uh, I couldn't get my political message through, and it was rarely to illustrate the loneliness of uh, being a captain uh, of a ship in, in any event, but being one in the Southern Hemisphere when there's no other British vessel in the Southern Hemisphere was a point I think needed to be emphasised. Uh, the second one, I hope, isn't prophetic, but nevertheless it was... Uh, written following a, another naval job I had where I was responsible for the defence of the offshore installations in the North Sea. Was there anything in your early background to suggest why you should turn to writing? I know your mother was an artist, but were you in contact with creative people in your youthful years? Very much so. We lived in Pompero during the uh, middle of the war. In fact, we were living there at the time when my mother died, although I was shot off to, a, to school, to, to, to board at a prep school at the age of six. Uh, but I used to come home to Paul Perry during the holidays, and my mother, as a painter, had many, paint, many friends from the Slade uh, Arts College in London who had, who had retreated to Cornwall at the beginning of the war. Uh, but she also had a very strong friendship, I think it could be described, with Francis Brett Young, of, who wrote, of course, my brother Jonathan, yes. who was, I think, very much uh, willing to to uh, to take me on um, and to, to perhaps progress some sort of artistic career with me, had uh, my mother lived and had we gone on living in that part of Cornwall. However, you became an orphan at the age of ten. What difference did that make to your life? Well, a great difference, really, because we were then brought up by my grandparents. There was a certain amount of tugging uh, because some people wanted to bring up my sister and some others wanted to bring me up and eventually my grandfather, who was an extremely strict disciplinarian, um, decided to step in and he brought, and he and, and his wife, my grandmother, uh, brought us both up, uh, also in Cornwall. Uh, and it was a very happy childhood, albeit a, a strict one, which is why I escaped in a rather rebellious way, perhaps when I was 18 or 19. And it was natural for you, because of the naval tradition, of course, to join the Royal Navy. Yes. Now, this is something of a television first, because it isn't often that an author gets the opportunity to interview a character from one of his own novels. But I myself uh, wrote a thriller set against the Falklands conflict some years ago, and you were in it. Uh, in fact, you were in several scenes, and I had the privilege and pleasure of sailing with you and Governor Rex under the Falklands down to the Antarctic. I'm explaining this in some detail because I'm about to enter an area in which I was myself personally involved, and in fact, I'm asking questions to which I sometimes already know the answers. When you were first given command of the Endurance, when you became our man in the South Atlantic, what did it mean to you? Well, it meant a great deal. I had become immersed in the subject, as you know by then, Bob. I had been briefed at Cambridge by the British Antarctic Survey, by the Scott Polar Institute, by the Foreign Office, and although the whole area was totally new to me, it, I became an enthusiast, the worst sort of convert, I suppose. Can you recall your impressions when you first set eyes on the Antarctic continent? Yes, absolute amazement. I, 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 every, every member of the ship's company uh, who hadn't uh, been down there for the previous season, as it's called, uh, came up to the bridge to look at the first iceberg, and uh, from then on, it was uh, it was just a. You know, there were masses of people on the upper deck. It's an exclusive to, to corner of the universe, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. And it's an exclusive club. What special problems did you face in sailing Antarctic waters? Well, navigational problems, of course, but we were down there to try and improve. One of the reasons we were there was as a survey ship, and of course now the Antarctic is becoming really quite popular as a tourist area. And I dread to think what would happen if one of those tourist ships ran aground because the area hadn't been properly surveyed. Ah, uh, I can recall you running us into the ice pack on one occasion. We were caught in the ice. We were trapped overnight and we couldn't get out, you remember? It was a, a Burns night and the ship was tilted on its side and we had a Burns night party and we were all drinking whiskey like this. It was one of the craziest Burns nights I can ever remember. But at the very time 
that you took over command of the Endurance, the British government was already planning to axe the vessel. How did you feel about that? Well, I had actually already been there for a few months before that, and therefore, full of enthusiasm, wanted to keep a British presence there, and felt that for the cost of three million pounds, which sounds a lot, but in defence terms is not all that much, uh, the old ship did so much for that three million pounds, both in scientific research and in uh, surveying, as I mentioned, and the guardship role, which I, I suppose didn't mean much to anybody until the decision had been made to withdraw it, which but of course sent all the signals to Argentina. Yes, you, you feel that that gave Argentina the green light to go ahead with the Falklands invasion. I think it was very much one of the green lights. Why did you feel at that time that it was so important for Britain to maintain her interests down there in the South Atlantic when after all it was 8,000 miles away? I think that the Antarctic uh, is becoming progressively uh, more explored, but the Falklands, of course, have always been the stepping stone, and a very British stepping stone to the Antarctic. Furthermore, there were 2,000 people, and still are, who did not want to become Argentines, and it was our duty to keep it British for as long as they wished it to be British. And since I knew most of them, and still do know quite a lot of them, uh, I felt that that was a, a point of view that I need to, needed to represent. And almost a personal responsibility. I think we also discovered on that particular voyage, Nick, that the Argentine designs, in fact, went far beyond the Falklands. They had their eye on the British Antarctic territories, on the Antarctic Peninsula, which they believed to be rich in oil. Yes, they still do have their eye on the same sector, of course, that is claimed, should the Antarctic Treaty not exist, which, God forbid, I think it will go on, I hope it will, uh, to the f into the foreseeable future, but Chile and Argentina and the British claim very much the same segment. When did you get your first whiff that an invasion might be on the cards? In December 1981, uh, there were various... Um, there were, there were odd things happened. There was an overflight by a, a Hercules, an Argentine Hercules, over South Georgia. Well, South, and it was on its way to the Antarctic, and it's a bit like going to, to, from London to Paris via Edinburgh. Um, it was way off track. Why, we asked. Um, presumably to see whether there were British troops, and there was actually an expedition at the time on South Georgia. Uh, we went to Ushuaia, um, the southernmost port in, in Argentina, and were told very firmly by the captain of the base there that we were in a war zone. And I asked, war against whom? Chile? As the, as the end of the Beagle Channel, and there'd been a Beagle Channel dispute for a long time, I was told, no, against you lot, <laughs> over the Malvinas. He actually said that. <laughs> he absolutely did. And I said, where's the Admiral, Zaratigi, who, it's a, who I knew well? Oh, he said he'd been sent for by Galtieri. You're not to speak to him, because you might get together, you two. So you passed these warnings on to the Admiralty. They ignored them. Was the government guilty of complacency? Do you believe the Falklands War could have been avoided? Yes, I, I quite definitely do believe that, because in 1977, the, there was a certain amount of sabre-rattling by Argentina at that time, and the government of the day, led by Mr. Callaghan, sent two frigates and a submarine south, uh, secretly, although it obviously was leaked to the Argentines that this was the case, and it snuffed it out straight away. So we might have done the same thing Absolutely. and saved the day. It was, in a sense, the endurance which sparked off the entire Falklands conflict, because you were the people who challenged the Argentine scrap metal men on South Georgia. Tell me how that happened. Well, I thought it was a bit like a creeping paralysis, Bob. They'd already taken another island called Southern Thule, and I thought any old excuse would do to, uh, to take South Georgia. And it wasn't until I heard the Argentine military saying to the so-called scrap dealers, operation well completed or well done, that I realised that this wasn't, a, wasn't any old scrap dealing operation, this was a military operation. Uh, and the next stage would be the Falklands. So what did you do? Well, Rex Hunt then reported this to uh, Sir Rex Hunt, the governor, to uh, London. And I was dispatched with my Marines to kick the Argentines out. But that was considered to be too much of an escalation. And so we were stopped at the 11th hour and the scrap dealers went, went on uh, uh, going about their business while the Argentines reinforced with a few more special forces guys, SAS type people. 
Um, and we were told to watch them for about 10 days while I landed my own Marines and they were hid away in attics and we, we kept a, a watch on the cliff tops and everywhere else until the shooting actually started. Well, you were eventually ordered by the Admiralty to head for the Falklands because by that time, I think they realized that the nasty stuff was about to hit the fan. But long before you got there, the Argentines had gone swarming in. Why did we hear so little about the endurance during the ensuing weeks? I think because we were carrying these special forces about. And as you know, if you carry the SAS or the SBS anywhere, you suddenly uh, go to ground, as it were, and you were never heard of again. We, of course, had lost at the beginning of that conflict. Our Marines put up a very spirited fight uh, in South Georgia. That was under Keith Mills. Under Keith Mills, knocking out a frigate and knocking down two helicopters, which was magnificent effort. Was the Endurance ever in serious danger from the Argentine submarine, the Santa Fe? Oh, very much so. The, the, that was a bit later on, because some of the task force led by HMS Antrim had come south by then. But the submarine was heard on the, again on the radio to be in the area, so the ships disappeared over the horizon, saying, it's all right, Nick, you've survived up to now. Uh, you can survive up a creek somewhere. And uh, that's exactly what we did. We made, like, painted red and white. We went out to look like an iceberg. Um, <laughs> Uh, by <laughs> night on radar and went up a creek during the day and hoped to God that nobody would come and would catch us there. Fortunately, I'd commanded an Exocet frigate before uh, Endurance, so I knew roughly what they had to do to get us. Uh, but I wasn't bargaining on submarines and airplanes all that much. You eventually crippled the Santa Fe and took the crew prisoner. What did the captain tell you then? Well, it was quite, a, it was quite uh, very briefly, um, we had, as I say, these special forces on board and they were get desperately trying to get ashore to go and kill somebody. And um, you know what it is when you put the SAS and the SBS together. And I rang up northward and asked if I could land these, these valuable troops before we were sunk. And uh, the, the officer I wished to speak to at northward was at lunch. So I said, well, could he ring me back after lunch? And uh, about half past four on Saturday afternoon, he rang me back and said, are you having a problem, Nick? And I said, yeah, quite a problem. Uh, there's an Argentine aeroplane going, on, uh, uh, going overhead, and it is having a conversation with a submarine on VHF. And I'm in, in Spanish, in, in clear language, and uh, I'm having it translated. And it is saying, that is endurance, landing special forces, which was dead right. And so when we had a go at the submarine the next day, and he surrendered, um, was actually the first the first missiles to be fired in anger. Um, we had the captain on board and we said, as a matter of interest, where were you on Saturday afternoon? And he said, looking at you guys through my periscope. Oh, we said, why didn't you shoot at us? He said, I don't know, but I think it was that excellent cocktail party you gave us in Mar del Plata. Because <laughs> that was the point, that the men on the Endurance, unlike anyone else in that conflict, actually knew many of the Argentines on the other side because you sometimes drank together in Buenos Aires. And in fact, this isn't widely known, Nick. In fact, I think it's not known at all. You yourself, while you were stalking Argentine vessels around the Falklands water, were emotionally and intimately involved with an Argentine lady. That must have made things a little bit tricky. Well, she, of course, uh, proved to be of immense value in the British Embassy. She was working in the British Embassy and had been working before the conflict and went on with the, the small staff that was left there under, I think, the Swiss flag, uh, but comes from an enormous family, like an octopus. They stretch out all over Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil. And consequently, I met a great m many members of that family. And they, of course, introduced me to other people, which was which gave me a background of, uh, of the Argentine and indeed the Uruguayan and the Brazilian uh, to an extent that I wouldn't have believed. So they were very useful in the intelligence sense. Very yeah. useful indeed. Uh, uh, you did, we did hear about you, of course, when you eventually spoke to the press and admitted that you had warned the British government about the impending war before it happened. Now, that really had a devastating effect upon your career eventually because there was a great hearing afterwards. Were you satisfied, were you satisfied with the findings of the Franks Committee? No, not really, to be blunt. Uh, I, I felt that, that the government were culpable. I say the government, I think that uh, government officials were cul culpable for that affair and had the messages got through 
uh, then action should and, and could have been taken to prevent it. Is it true, Nick, that at that time you were personally ordered by the Prime Minister herself, Margaret Thatcher, to keep your mouth shut? Yes, indirectly, of course, came down the line, and I was told not to make any comment whatever after the Frank's inquiry. Well, you eventually retired from the Royal Navy, and you moved to Northumberland. You always told me you would, but I didn't believe you, because after all, you're a southerner. What is it about Northumberland which appeals to you so much? Well, Northumberland and the North East. I've, I've been referred to as an adopted Geordie, and I'm very proud of it. Of course, endurance was painted red and white, and I'd have to paint her black and white to get her up the time, <laughs> so she could only go <laughs> to the weir. And my last naval job was the HMS Sheffield, built at Swan Hunters. Uh, and so I have many, many connections and many friends stretching back 20 or 30 years in the Northeast. And so we are delighted now as a family uh, to be living in the Upper Coquit, but to be working in Sunderland. I was about to take that up because as well as the thriller writing, you have taken a bit of a gamble. You're running a business venture down in Sunderland. And you say that you hope, or you would certainly like to get the river Weir operating as a fully functional river again. Just explain what you mean by that. Well, I have, I've done some pretty stupid things in my, in my life. Uh, and one was starting a, a company at the beginning of a recession but we've survived so far. But the end of my, my crusade, really, here is to try and bring shipping, and I mean shipping, back to the River Weir and the River Tyne in that order. Because I think the Weir is a, is a wonderful natural harbour, and since the demise of shipbuilding and export, exporting coal, of course, the, nothing much happens on the Weir. There, there are a few ships that come in and out. But it could be used, and it could be used for, for completely different reasons. It's convenient to Northern Europe. We can open up routes between the northeastern part of Europe, the part of Europe that used to be behind the Iron Curtain. And it's got a huge catchment area of Glasgow, Edinburgh, right down as far as Leeds. And we wouldn't clog up the M1 with all these trucks going backwards and forwards. We could get the stuff on the ships here in the northeast. If you get this going, can you see yourself turning to full-time writing? Yes, if I can see that, underway, I will be very happy to go, go back up to the upper coquette and get on with some writing, <laughs> and, and I'll be dead happy. Well, Nick, with uh, all your experiences, you must have a wealth of material for at least a hundred thrillers, and I look forward to reading them. The best of luck both in your business ventures and in the writing itself, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much indeed. Bamburgh Castle on the Northumberland coast, for centuries a fortress against hostile armies, but on Friday the 17th of December its defences were breached by a gang of thieves. Using extending ladders and nylon rope they broke into the King's Hall and smashed open display cabinets. Here are just a few of the items which were taken. Perhaps you've been offered some of them for sale or know where they're hidden. They include a number of trinket boxes, this silver tea service and tray, a pair of candelabra, a silver watch and a silver scent bottle, and this distinctive cherub and pink bulldog. They're worth a great deal and have been in the Armstrong family for generations. If you've any idea where the property is, or who carried out the raid, or can help solve any other crime, ring Crime Stoppers now on 0800 treble 5 treble 1. Get ready for some...